people are joining, so I'm just going to give people a minute or two to join the link and then we'll kick off. Got a good few participants this evening, which is great. See some familiar faces out there. Well, familiar names anyway. Let's wait a couple more. A little bit more time to see if some more people are joining. <clears throat> Thank you, Peter. Would be nice to see you too. <laughs> okay, I think we'll kick off now. So, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Economic Research Council Viewpoint webinar. We're going to be covering the future of social care, who should pay? Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name's Jack Mallander and I'm an executive committee member for the Economic Research Council. Um, if you're not already a member of the ERC, please do consider joining. Uh, we're a charity committed to extending the reach of economic education, debate, leadership. And as part of that, we host events to cultivate wider accessibility, inclusion, civic participation, and this is one such event. So while I have your attention, you might also be interested in registering for our next event, uh, which is on the housing market, and it's delivered by Simona Paravani Mellenhoff, who is the Managing Director and Global CIO of Solutions at BlackRock. But back to tonight. Uh, our speaker this evening is Natasha Curry. Uh, I first met Natasha when we both worked for the same research company back in 2002 and she had just returned from several years working in China. We had the pleasure of working together for the following three years and uh, Natasha left us to join the King's Fund in 2005 and after six years as a fellow in health policy she moved to the Nuffield Trust where she's now Deputy Director of Policy. So welcome Natasha. Um, she has just recently been named one of the Health Service Journal's 100 wild cards. Um, for those of you who don't know, these are 20 individuals included in the HSJ 100 who are not currently exercising power at the very highest level, but who should be. <laughs> and the main reason for this, I think, is her work on social care, which has been outstanding. And tonight she's going to reflect on our social care fund dilemma and uh, share with us experiences from Japan and Germany, which she studied in some depth um, and with announcements on the future of social care funding in England. Yeah, it will be interesting to hear what insights we can learn to further inform the debate. Uh, it's also before we start just worth spending a moment to reflect on some forthcoming and important research on social care Natasha and the Nuffield Trust are involved with. Uh, she and her colleagues will be taking a closer look at the social care provider market in England and identifying what's working and what isn't. Um, and also there may be lessons from the market reforms that have already taken place in Germany and Japan and the other countries of the UK. Um, and then Natasha's colleague Nina Hemmings is looking at the international evidence on the professionalization in the social care workforce. So this is often touted as the solution to the immense workforce challenges faced in social care, but what does it actually mean and, and what have been the experience of other countries in trying to implement it? So I'm really looking forward to hearing the results of that new research when the time comes. Um, but uh, back to this evening. Uh, Natasha is going to be presenting on, as I said, the topic, the future of social care, who should pay. Um, she's going to speak for about 30 minutes and then I'm going to open the floor to questions. So if you'd like to pose a question, you can do so anytime throughout the talk. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of the page 
um, on, on your screen. So just press that and submit your question. And I will um, pose, I'll, I'll take those questions and, and pose to Natasha any that aren't already answered by her talk. And I, I, may, I may group some together if we get similar questions. Um, anyway, I'll do my best. We're aiming to close around 7 p.m., but if any of you would like to linger for a more informal chat for about 15 minutes afterwards, please do so. Um, anyway, without further delay, I'm going to hand over to Natasha to share her thoughts and hopefully her slides. Thanks, Jackie, and thanks for that, um, that introduction. Yeah, so I've been at the Nottingham Trust now for nine years, and over the last few years, I've been leading our social care uh, research program. and what we've focused on is looking at whether we can inject some new ideas or new thinking into the debate which seems to go around in circles in this country. So let me try and share my slides. Um, okay. Hopefully everybody can see that. Jackie, can you see my slides okay? Yes, but you're not in screen share yet. You're not uh, in slideshow. Oh, that's odd. Uh, hold on, it's showing up on my screen as... Is that working? We can see your slides. Yeah. It's just not a slideshow, but... Carry on, let's see how we go. That's, can you see that? That's really strange. Can you not see, can you see my slides? I can see your slide, but it's not presenting as a slideshow like it was earlier on. Let me see if I can get this to work. Is that better? Yes, perfect. Excellent, sorry, I don't know what happened there. Apologies for that. Except, um, yes, we can see your next slide as well now, but that's fine. <laughs> oh. That's really, really odd. It was working perfectly before, wasn't it? Um, yes. Let me just have one last go at, at doing that. You wouldn't believe we had actually rehearsed this, everyone. <laughs> Is that <laughs> working? Three minutes before we started, we rehearsed it. <laughs> Is that working now? Can you still um, see can, my next one? We can see it, um, but not present, uh, as if you were looking at the bit that you look at, not the actual present presentation. So we can see the next slide and your notes. Oh, hold on. If, if I do it like that, That's is that fine. any better? That's okay, perfect. I'll go with that, yeah. but I don't know what's <laughs> happened here. Apologies. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, so we've been looking at um, what we might be able to learn from um, other countries and focused mainly on, on Germany and Japan so far. Um, so before I get into the international picture and learning, I just wanted to touch on the context a little bit just for maybe people who are on the, the call who are not so familiar with the sector or maybe dialing in from overseas. Um, and these are the sorts of headlines that we're used to seeing. Um, the word crisis comes up a lot when, we're, um, when we see headlines about social care. But I just wanted to unpick that a little bit and talk about what sits behind those headlines and whether there is really a, a, a crisis in the system. Well, Part of the issue um, here is that over the last couple of decades, need for social care has been rising. And that's driven partly by our changing demographics. We all know we have an aging population as shown by the uh, population pyramid there. Um, and that has driven a rise in need. So the King's Fund estimates that estimates there are about um, 2 million new requests for social care in 2017-18 to 2018-19. That's a rise of about 4%. Now, about um, the request for the over for need amongst the over 65s increased at around 3%. Now that's approximately in line with what you'd expect just from a, an expanded population. But the bit that's more surprising and that is less sort of understood and, and less well covered is that the need amongst working age adults is rising at quite a rapid rate, rap more rapidly than the over 65s. So in that same period, the, the um, number of requests for working age adults increased by 5%. And that represents an, a, an actual increase in the rate of, of requests amongst that population. And that's driven by people living longer into adulthood with disabilities, learning disabilities, etc. So that's the that's 
um, that's what's driving the, the need. At the same time, what we've seen over the last decade is some quite steep uh, drops in the funding that's going into the system. So this shows the funding or expenditure on social care from 2009 to 2019. And as you can see, there's quite a steep drop. It has increased a bit in the last few years as we've seen some injections of, of cash um, over the last five years, but it's still below, uh, the real term spending is still below what it was in 2009. So we see a, a, an increasing gap here between the need going in one direction and the funding going in another. So in that sense, there is a crisis. There's a real, there's a real uh, problem in, in the system. And of course, it's important to point out that social care isn't free at the point of use. It's not like the NHS. It's a means tested system. Um, and so your access is subject to a means test. So if you have income, savings or assets uh, of 23, £1,250 or above, you can't access publicly funded care. Now below that there's a bit of a sliding scale until you hit £14,250, below which you can access for fully funded public, uh, uh, public funding for your, for your care. However, it's also, access is also subject to a needs test. So even if you have assets and savings below that fourteen thousand pounds, you, if your needs are not um, assessed as being high enough, you also can't access public funding. So there's two parts to the system here: needs and means. And that comes as quite a, of a surprise to people. Many people think that social care is part of the NHS and free at point of, of use. And so what that means is that we have a publicly funded system of care that's accessible only to those with the very highest needs and the very lowest means. And we also see a lot of individuals left with very high costs. So, uh, so Andrew Dillnott in his review in 2011 estimated that about one in 10 people aged over 65 face care costs in excess of £100,000 over their lifestyle. So these are kind of catastrophic costs and that's the narrative that we hear quite a lot in the newspapers i think people being forced to sell their house because they're, they're they're facing very high costs i think the bit of the story that's less well thought about or less well covered in, in the media is is those people who are who might have some meager means so might just just be above that um threshold that means threshold or the people who are just below the threshold, but actually they have moderate needs and, and their local authority determines that their needs do not warrant public funding. So there's a lot of people with unmet or undermet care in, in, in society, care needs in society. And so what we've seen is, a, is an increasing reliance on unpaid carers. So Carers UK estimate was about 9 million carers before COVID. Um, caring for, for relatives or friends and obviously that has some quite severe implications for their health and their, their financial future. Now the other part of the system which um, I just wanted to mention before we move on is, is the sense of unfairness and um, inequity that comes from the fact that your access to care can also vary by council so it depends where you live. Um, and that's driven by the fact that social care funding flows partly through from national government to councils, but councils also have an ability to raise money locally through council tax through the social care precept. And so if you're in a more deprived area, if, uh, if your council has less ability to raise money, then the amount available to them to spend on, on social care is reduced. So there's a, a kind of, we, we hear a lot postcode lottery, but I think it really is a postcode lottery. The other consequence of the of the problems I've just described are that the fees that are paid to social care providers by councils have been being reduced over time, uh, and we've seen many providers say leaving the market, saying that uh, the care market is not viable, and have been handing back contracts to councils. To stay afloat, what we've seen providers doing is cross subsidising. So they're charging people who are self funders, people who pay for their own care more than council funded individuals. So you, you can have a scenario in a care home, say, where there are two individuals, one self-funding and is paying 40% more than the person in the next room who's funded by the council. So there's a, there's a, a deep feeling of, of, of inequity in, in the system. 
And the other knock on effect of, of, of all of this is a huge workforce challenge. We have vacancies in excess of 100,000 um, people at any one time. The pay is low. We have recruitment and retention problems. So the, the whole system is in, is in need of reform. So wh how, why is it that we're in 2020 in this situation? It's, it's a problem that we've known about for a, a long time. So this report was published in 1999. Um, and called for an urgent reform of the whole system. That triggered reform in Scotland, but didn't gain traction in England. And since then, we've seen a series of reviews, commissions, a bit of legislation, inquiries. Um, these are just to name a few. There are many, many more. Um, and then in 2017, Theresa May promised a green paper. That was delayed and delayed and finally disappeared. And then, uh, Boris Johnson's government promised a social care white paper in 2019 and I just wanted to remind you of what he said when he took office in July 2019. He said, I'm announcing now on the steps of Downing Street that we will fix the crisis in social care once and for all with a plan we have prepared. We're still waiting to see that plan um, and when we look back over our experience of, of funding proposals over the last decade or so. What we've seen is proposals being put forward, usually at the time of an election, when there's very little incentive for, for the party, political parties to cooperate or work together. And we've seen the debate about social care funding become really quite politically toxic. So in, the, in 2010, we had Labour's proposals being called a death tax. In 2017, we saw Theresa May's proposals being dubbed dementia tax and it, so it becomes a very very political discussion and, and we fail to move on from that. So I wanted to reflect on two countries that have managed to reform their social care systems and to talk about mainly the funding but I do want to make the point that our system is in need, in need of fundamental reform it's not just about the funding we need a lot of things to go alongside that but I just wanted to to focus today mostly on, on the funding. Why look at these countries? Well, they're two advanced economies with quite challenging demographic, uh, demographic outlook. So if you see here, this is, this is the UK in 2040. We think we'll have about 8% of people aged over 80. Japan's already there. It's actually passed that now. So by looking at Japan, we're sort of looking into our future. Germany is aging slightly more rapidly than us, but has a similar sort of population profile. So that gives us an, an indication of the scale of the need in society. But of course, it's also about how we fund a new system as well. And when we think about the ratio of dependent older people, so people over 65 to, to working age people, we see that we're going to be facing quite a challenging future. Um, in, this is us in 2050, as you'll see, Japan has already surpassed us there and is looking at an even more challenging um, ratio between those two groups. And so I just wanted to give a, a very quick um, overview of each, each of the systems before I get into the funding detail. Um, I'll talk about Germany a bit first because that was introduced first and Japan built on Germany's system and tweaked it um, in some quite clever ways, I think. So it was introduced in, in 1995 everybody pays into a specific pot on starting employment um, and anyone with a care need can access this, the survey, the, the system. So it doesn't matter how old you are, where you live, whether your condition is to do with mental health or physical health, if you have a care need, you will be, be assessed. Now, Germany's system is based on the principle of social solidarity. So it's, it's intended to offer a basic minimum level of care to all. Japan learned from Germany and it introduced its system in 2000. Everybody pays in from the age of 40. Now we can come back to why 40 a bit, a bit later perhaps. Um, but it's only accessible to people age 65 or over. It's quite limited um, in the younger age bands. But apart from the, the, the age restriction, it doesn't matter again where you live, what sort of condition you have, it, if it's a cognitive or physical illness. If you have needs, you'll be assessed in the same way. Now, Japan's vision for the system was uh, slightly different to Germany. So it's intended as a, a generous system. 
aimed at promoting independence and, and wellness. Now, alongside the funding reform, they also re both reformed the eligibility process and criteria. So that based on need only, there's no means test in, in, this, in the assessment of, of need. So this consistency in access, which I think helped to build um, public support. Once you're assessed, you're assigned to a care level um, and alongside that care level goes a monthly budget, which is set at that care level. So that, again, there's a consistency there. It doesn't depend on where you live. Um, so your fixed monthly budget is for care only. You need to be clear about that. There are hotel fees, so bed and board if you're in residential care. So there's kind of clarity there about what people are paying in and, and what the benefits are. But the services are not free at the point of use. There is some shared burden between the state and the individual, and we'll loop back to that in a minute. So in terms of the funding systems, so in both systems, the, the part of the, uh, of the funding um, system is the idea of risk falling, so spreading that risk across society. As I said, everyone in employment pays in in Germany. In Japan, the decision was made to um, ask people to pay in from the age of 40. Now, that was a very deliberate decision there because it was felt that people would be more willing to pay in from that age because A, they'd be more financially stable and B, they'd be able to see the benefits of the system because they're likely to have older relatives. Now, both systems are based largely on social insurance, but Germany has gone with a very strict social insurance uh, approach. Now, I think the term social insurance isn't very well understood in, in England because we don't really have an equivalent. It's not exactly a tax. It's a national fund that is administered by an arm's length body. So it's sort of depoliticized in a way and it's highly transparent. It's very, very strictly ring fenced. It can't be topped up and it can't be diverted to, to any other use. So whilst that gives it a lot of transparency, it's not very flexible. So Japan realized that maybe flexibility could be quite useful and went for a, a bit of a blended model. So the 50% of the system is uh, funded through social insurance, but the other half is funded through general taxation, which gives them both the transparency, but also a bit of flexibility. And importantly, in both systems, it was familiar. They chose familiar funding structures um, to, to build public support. So people pay in from their, their monthly paycheck, a fixed percentage of income which is shared with employers in both countries it's around three percent at the moment so and it, someone in employment would pay 1.5 percent now interestingly the retired population continue to pay in they pay in the full percentage from their pension and then on accessing services users continue to users do contribute to costs but the systems diverge here in in several important ways which i think are quite interesting for us to, to reflect on a little bit. So in Japan, the, the care system is consistent with health. So in the health service, people are used to paying co-payments when they access um, services. It's the same in, in the care system. It's different in Germany. So the German healthcare system, it's free at the point of use, but for the care system, you have to pay a co-payment. That causes some confusion that we might want to reflect on when designing our own um, system, given that the the clarity of the NHS and that being great point of use. Germany and in Germany recipients of benefits can opt for cash or in-kind benefits and it was a deliberate decision to, to include cash in the, in the system because it, the family, the idea of the family is very central to German culture and, and as part of the system they wanted to encourage and facilitate um, family carers. In Japan they went for in-kind benefits only, and that was because they actively wanted to shift the burden of care away from families onto society. Partly that was an economic driver because they wanted to free up mainly women to enter the work workforce because of their shrinking working age population. Now in Germany, because the, the idea was to provide a minimum basic level of care, um, there was an expectation that individuals would then pay for the, the, the other part of, of care costs. Now that has become a bit of a problem recently, which I'll come on to in a, in a moment. In Japan, conversely, users pay about 10%, can be up to 30% for very high earners, around 10% of the, of the care costs. 
but that's capped on a monthly basis. So even if you're, you have very intensive care needs and you're in a residential setting, your costs are, are capped monthly so that you're not penalised for having very high needs. So the, the issue with Germany here is the decision to offer partial coverage of costs. Um, it was intended to be about 50% of, of costs would be covered by the state, the state and the individual would then cover the other half. The problem with that is that, as you can see on this graph here, from 1999 to 2017, we've, we've seen an increase. The yellow one is the average um, care costs. Has, they've risen quite steeply, and benefits have not kept up with that. So we're seeing in, people being faced with increasing costs. And that's becoming a bit of a, a, an issue in Germany and is leading to some debates about whether they need to introduce a cap on costs. They attempted to introduce individual supplementary insurance, um, but that's been largely unsuccessful. And I can talk a bit about that in a moment. So what does this mean for funding options in England? Well, obviously these countries are two very different contexts and I think any uh, funding reform has to be very embedded in the culture and the context in which it's, it's designed. But I think there are some universal principles that we might want to learn from. So firstly, I think it, at the core of any system for care, we have to have a risk pooling system. We need to be able to spread the risk across society because the, the, the situation we have now with individuals being hit with catastrophic care costs is, is not fair. And I think that has to be at the heart of, of what we do. I think we have to think very carefully about sustainability. We need this system to work now and in the future. And I think what we've seen in the German example with a very strictly ring-fenced budget is that that's not being flexible enough. So I think we need to think about what our demographics are going to look like in 2040, 2050, and, and think about what might make sense um, up to there. Now, fairness is obviously a very subjective, and very sort of culturally specific concept and, and quite complex. Um, and I think it's interesting when we look at the German and Japanese examples that they, the revenue raising mechanisms are just based on income alone. Um, but in our society, I think there's such a, a, an issue here about property wealth and, and the intergeneral, inter intergenerational fairness issue that I think any funding um, option needs to take that into account. And obviously our, our regional disparities as well. And then finally, the other principle that I think should underpin any funding decisions is that it has to be understandable. Inevitably, we need to have people contributing to this system. And so we need to get their support and we need people to understand and trust it. So we've been doing a, look, a bit of work looking back over the last 20 years uh, at the main, the 15 main options that people have proposed for funding. And I won't go through all of them because that would be really tedious, but I'm, I'm going to talk briefly through four of the, the ones that seem to be gaining the most traction, the most interest at the moment. And then maybe in the discussion we can talk about some of the, the others. So the pension style opt-out scheme has been raised quite frequently, I think, as, as a potential option. So this is um, a, a scheme that you're automatically or auto-enrolled in, alongside, you know, in the same model as pensions have been introduced. Um, and you build up an individual fund towards care. So if we think about the four tests, the four principles that I've just outlined, it, it fails the first, does it pull risk because it's an individual pool. It wouldn't inject more money into the, into the system now, it might in the future, but it doesn't cover the people now, so it fails that. Now, is it fair? This is, again, quite subjective, but I think the, because the value of the pot reflects the individual's income, and that would be smaller for lower income. So there's a question mark for me about whether that is fair, given that your ability to afford social care was then proportionate to your income. Is it understandable? Potentially, because it, it could be modelled on the auto enrolment pension system. The other option that's been floated quite a lot and was part of the Dill Not proposals in 2011 has been floated again by Damien Green quite recently is, is the idea of an individual insurance opt out scheme. So this would be similar to the pension scheme, you'd be opted in, but you could, you could 
auto enroll but you could opt out um so it pulls risk up to a point but only for those who opt in so you need people to stay in the scheme um and there's a question mark for me about whether there'd be financial protection for those who opt out it could inject money into the short term but i'm not sure if it would how long it would take to raise sufficient funds to cover the extent of the need um would it be fair it depends uh, where those contributions are set, but it could become quite a burden for lower earners. But I think that the issue for me about individual insurance is that unlike a pension scheme, um, if you had no need for social care, you would re receive nothing in return. So for me, there's little incentive, especially for younger people, to want to contribute to such a scheme. Now, I mentioned before that Germany tried this. They tried in 2012, they launched an individual insurance scheme and they subsidised it to try and encourage uptake. In the end, they've abandoned it because only 4% 4 4 of people actually took it up. Demand was low and the demand was only amongst people who, had, who were at high risk of need. So as an insurance model, it, it quickly became unsustainable. And I think in an, in an opt-out scheme as has been proposed, where it's a voluntary scheme, I think it, we wouldn't get the demand to make it sustainable in the long term. Now the lifetime cap on costs is another proposal that comes up frequently and again it was proposed by uh, uh, Sir Andrew Dilnot in 2011. Um, and so how does it do against our test? I think there are some question marks around, around the cap. I think it has some merit if it's put along some, alongside some other measures but on its own, it only pools the risk of catastrophic costs for care. So only for those who, who exceed that cap on, on spending, it doesn't help up to the, the, the cap. Now it's not a revenue generating approach and it's often talked about a, a, a funding solution, but actually it's not, it doesn't raise any money. So how it works and whether it's fair depends on which, what mechanism is put alongside it. Um, to fund it because it wouldn't raise money it would actually cost the state more money um, fairness also depends on where the level of the cap is so andrew dillnott when he proposed it put it to thirty-five thousand. when it was brought in in the care act in 2014 it was set at seventy-two thousand, and then others have proposed a cap at a hundred thousand pounds so that to some people that would be a catastrophic amount of money so in Andrew Dillnock's proposals, he was assuming the financial services industry would move in and offer insurance products for people to insure themselves up to the cap. But as it happened, the insurance industry didn't show much interest in that because um, they don't see it as a, as a sustainable market. And then the other question I have around the cap is, is it understandable? Well, it's quite difficult to explain to the public because what's included in the cap? What counts as care? Would it be personal care? Would it be wider social care? Um, how is it administrated? Um, is there a floor? So is there, would there be a minimum amount of, of assets or income savings that you keep, that you spend down to? How would it be administered? So I think there are lots of questions around the cap for me. And then the last option that we reviewed is just general taxation. Um, and obviously this is how we fund most of our public services. So it, it's a familiar and understood mechanism. It pulls risk. Um, like other public services like the NHS and, and education, that's the risk of catastrophic costs would be spread across society. That obviously depends on whether it's a free at the point of view service. It could raise money now. Fairness, there's a question mark here for me around where the burden falls. And going back to what I talked about in Japan and Germany, where the revenue re is raised through income alone, I think we want to think here about a combination of mechanisms, perhaps that draw on income and wealth potentially. And so the question that often is asked of me and, and, and colleagues in this space is, well, how much will the system cost? And, and I, I, my answer is always, well, it depends, because I think part of the problem, part of the reason that we haven't made more progress in this space is because we start in the wrong place. We start with the funding question and we get it we get tied up in the intricacies of funding but actually there are some fundamental questions we need to ask first first one is well what sort of system do we want and that will determine how generous we want to make it we need to decide well should individuals 
and, and the state share the financial burden like they do in Japan and Germany? Or do we want to create a free at the point of view service more akin to the NHS? That has implications, obviously, for funding. And then what services should be funded by the state if we, if we do have a shared model? Should it just be personal care? Should it be a wider set of services? And then I think really key to this and where we need to start being more explicit is about, well, what do we expect of family and unpaid carers? Do we expect them to have a role? Is it realistic to expect them not to have a role given the workforce pressures? And then we need to think about, well, Est accurate estimates of unmet and undermet need in society and then project that into the future. There's a, a cautionary tale from Japan when they launched their very generous system, they underestimated the amount of unmet need in society and their demand increased really rapidly and they had to, to row back and make the system slightly less generous. And then we need to think about the whole system, uh, the, the workforce and the provider market as well to, to make the whole thing work effectively. So why are we here and why are Germany and Japan, why were they successful in their, in their attempts to reform? Well, I think it's, it's helpful to reflect on the fact that discussions there took time as well. They took around a decade, so we're not unusual in taking a long time. But I think the difference that I observed there versus here is that in both countries, there was a really widespread public discontent about the lack of care, costs of care. And I think we're seeing that a little bit now, but not to the level where it's really forcing through um, significant change. But I think the, the discussions about reform started in a different place. They didn't just leap straight to who's going to pay. They sought to create a vision around which they could build public and political support and then design the system to go with the grain of social change and, and the challenges in society we needed addressing. And then because of the, that, public pressure and the, 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 the creation of a vision, the reform was seen, was, became a vote winner. And so all parties wanted to be part of, of reform and wanted to try and cooperate. And there was also strong political leadership, particularly in Germany, there was one individual who gained cross-party support and was really the face of reform over the course of a, of a decade. And then in both countries, there was an economic and political upheaval which sort of changed the, the social discourse. So in Germany reunification ushered in a, a different discussion about public services. In Japan the economic crash in the early 90s triggered some of the thinking around how the market could work and how to, to release more and more people into the, into the workforce. So what's the prospects here? Given the history over the last 20 years of kind of reform and then kind of stagnating debate, um, I think there is some glimmers of hope here. I think COVID, although it's been a terrible time, particularly for the social care sector, has shone a light on social care. And the, the public awareness is, is high and interest in social care is high. And there's, a, there's a, now a real political consensus for change. I think what is needed now is a plan around which we can build that, that, um, build that support and, and develop it. So just looking back at last week, Boris Johnson gave another speech in which he said he fixed the injustice of care home funding, bringing the magic of averages to the rescue of millions, which is a Churchillian phrase, which uh, referred to national insurance at that time, but it's also a phrase that was used by Andrew Dilnot. So we're not sure if that's hinting at a cap or at some sort of um, national pooled budget. So th there's active debate in government about this. But what we need now, I think, is a clear plan and not just a plan for care homes. That concerns me slightly that it's just focused on care. This has to be a plan that is that looks at comprehensive reform, for the entire system in a sustainable and fair way. Thank you, Jackie. Well, thank you very much, Natasha. That was a, a, a good balance of uh, coverage and uh, detail. <laughs> I will stop um. sharing now and hope that. <laughs> Hope this works. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. We've had some, we've had uh, quite a few questions come in, so I'm going to try and run through them uh, sequentially if I can. But the first one's from Janice, Janice Steed. Um, she's she's asking a question about Scotland mm. and Scotland's system. And I think uh, she's making particular reference to the uh, uh, the free at the point of use for community care uh, mm. and whether that improves. Um, 
uh, I suppose, reablement in terms of uh, post uh, when you've got a problem, when you've had a, a health problem and, and you're being discharged back into a, an, an ongoing care setting. But mm. how, how does the Scottish system differ from ours um, and, and how does it compare maybe to Germany and Japan? Yeah, so the, the Scottish system was reformed after that um, in commission in 99 and they brought in free personal care at that point. Um, so the, I think the, the term free personal care is where things get a bit tricky here. So personal care is a very narrow set of services. It's, it's washing, dressing, toileting, preparing meals. That's it. So that's free. But wider social care is still means tested. So, for example, if you're uh, if you want help going out and about to a lunch club, that wouldn't come under free personal care. And what we saw was, although that it's quite a nice package of care that's free, it wasn't accompanied by funding reform. So, the money was just repurposed, if you like. So, some services that were free before, like help, having someone help you put the bins out. That was that's now your charge for that so because it wasn't accompanied by that i think this goes back to my point about the importance of kind of a, a fundamental reform that's not just about the funding it's not just about it it all has to come together so i think the scottish system has some merit but i think it's more limited than than people realize um and mm. some of the proposals here about a national care service again come down to they're talking about free or personal care which is quite a limited set of services mm. Mm. yes um and and um just on that do they is it is it that the service is free or do they get an amount of money to pay for the service however they would like to pay for it so home you, you care, touched on that in your discussion about germany getting the opt being able to opt for for money to pay for their own care rather than be given care yeah, I mean, we do have the option of personal budgets in, in this country, um, which the, the uptake of those is, is quite limited. Um, in the Scottish system, my understanding is that the, the package of care is free. If you're in a care home, that there's a set amount that's paid to the care home, but no, there's no sort of individual amount that's based mm. on your care level. So in the German and Japanese system, you get sort of a set amount according to that sort of you know, grade of need that you have. Yes, I'm going to cut. If, with, I'm going to use chair's privilege at the end and come back to a question on that okay. for me. <laughs> but um, uh, I won't hold the floor. So, um, uh, um, just a, a quick um, uh, comment more from Francis about Francis Dickinson about whether we are whether you're assuming everyone over 65 yeah. is dependent i'm of uh, course having... not no <laughs> but um, it's just to illustrate that kind of that balance yeah. you know and the kind of demographic trends yes mm. looking at that 80 plus box <clears throat> in 2040 i'm thinking i'll be in that box and well well will i be sitting here doing this who knows um know. <laughs> but um a question from peter west is the german insurance scheme separate for care or is it within is it part of the wider social insurance scheme for health are they two separate schemes they're two separate things they are administered by the same arm's length organizations but they're very separate um my impression is that they're slightly more integrated because the social care um, system provides some nursing care so there's a bit more of a sort of crossover in Japan the, the long-term care system is really quite wide and and, joy, and includes quite a bit of health care but in both countries they have decided to keep them completely separate sort of systems and separately funded mm -hmm. and another uh, point from uh, Peter is about the um, uh, the German user charges, which he's saying average around 600 euros a month, mm -hmm. which is around the same level as the state pension here. So um, uh, is that a sort of an acceptable amount that if we were to adopt that kind of model, because pensioners could pay for it essentially out of their pension? Yeah, um, well, when you look at the German user charges and, and you compare them to the to average English charges, they come out at roughly half mm. of, of what what we pay so the so yeah this is why that in the german system there's quite a lot of debate about whether that's an acceptable level acceptable amount for yeah. people to pay and at the moment there's quite a lot of talk about no it's not it's becoming you know too much and there needs to be some sort of cap on on them they're talking a, about a monthly cap there interestingly um so following the, the japanese 
model, which I think is quite interesting in that it's possibly more understandable than a lifetime cap. I don't know, mm. in terms of people getting their heads around what sort of liability they might face and if they need care, perhaps. So Catherine Thompson's got a question on the cap. In fact, we've got a couple of questions on the cap. I'll, I'll try and focus mm. on those um, for a moment. She said, she asked, does a cap on care costs advantage the more affluent in the population? Yeah. Yes. And uh, um, so could, is there any way it could be applied to be a bit more progressive? Well, that's part one of my main sort of um, hesitations about the cap, actually, because it, it disproportionately benefits people, more wealthy people. I mean, if it's paired with a floor, so if you're allowed to keep, uh, you know, some people have proposed that you might have a floor of £100,000, so you can sort of spend down to that, but you hold on to that amount of asset. It, that helps a little bit, but it's, it's essentially not a very progressive mechanism, I think. And um, uh, Peter West is pointing out again that the care cap would be calculated at an official rate, presumably, so if if you are more affluent and you want a luxury hotel, you can <laughs> well, uh, that, yeah, face well, that comes, cost yourself. Yeah, and it comes down to what's included and what's not not included, and I think it gets quite complicated. So, if you're just talking about care, or are you talking about care home costs as well? Would they be separate? Um, mm. And yeah, depending on on what sort of care you have, you could spend up to your cap quite quickly. Others might not spend up so quickly. I think it's, I just think it's quite a complex concept um, in the way that it's been talked about. So actually that brings me quite neatly on to Tom Jones, Tom James's question. He's interested to hear what insights you have into whether the government, what the government's perspective is on the Japan and Germany model, you know, because obviously the, the cap was, as you said, the deal not proposal, but what, what, what do you think the government's our government, do you yes, think? our there. government. So they they're interested in it in both of them. Um, I've talked to them about both models. Um, I think there's clearly some interest in the German model. So there was a paper by Jane Green's think tank earlier this year about having proposing a sort of a basic level of care for everybody, and then having people sort of top up, which is sort of a, a bit like the German model. Um, so I, there's definite interest and then you, you'll have seen some headlines over the summer around asking the over 40s to pay into a fund to, to fund care and I think that's taken from the Japanese model. I think that you have to ask questions about what is 40 the right age here? Why, why 40? I mean Japan went through years of debate uh, about what, at what age it's appropriate to ask people to start paying in um, so I don't think we could just you know drag and drop either of the systems here they wouldn't work but I think we can sort of take ideas and principles from them and create our own system that works in our context. Mm. Good thank you. Um, there's so many questions pouring in it's hard <laughs> to keep up with them. Um, can we just move on to think a little bit about the issue around the professional workforce and carers and I think this in a way comes back to the point I was raising earlier because I do I do know that in Germany and in some other countries there increasingly a higher proportion of people are opting to use funding to pay for their families and relatives to yeah. look after them at home and I know there was a Mori survey a couple of years ago which demonstrated a lot of people have a, would like that as a solution but but that says something about the whole professionalization of the workforce. Mm -hmm. Francis Dickinson's raised a question specifically on this. He, he says, I understand that carers are treated as a professional workshop, workforce in Germany, better training, registration, better paid. So quite a different kind of resource. Mm -hmm. So how does that impact potentially on the funding? So yes, they, they have, well, the German workforce has a higher level of qualification. They, they, we don't, they don't have, the same sort of, you know, in quite poorly trained care workforce like we do here, you have to have a minimum level of training, but the pay is still pretty poor and they still compete with retail for, um, uh, for, for staff. So both Germany and Japan have severe workforce issues. It is, yeah. They haven't cracked that at all. Um, and what we've seen in Germany is a, a sort of gray market for immigrant staff to come in and live with people, sort of like an au pair 
mm-hmm. often from Eastern Europe to live with a family and provide care. And some of these people provide care for sort of four weeks with no break and then they swap with another family member so there's a, a big gray market which when we spoke to policymakers in germany they know about it and they realize that that's propping up the system because they don't wow. have the professional workforce that they need can't tackle it because they realize that to address the kind of fundamental pay issues would be hugely expensive and in the system that they've created where the only way to get more revenue into the system is to put individual contributions up it's quite inflexible whereas japan mm. has that sort of general taxation pot that it can use a bit more flexibly but having said that because japan has gone down the route of only having um in-kind care so no cash payment so there's no option to fund a family member to provide care they've got an even bigger workforce pressure mm. um, so both countries are looking at immigration um, international recruitment to try and plug some of those gaps but the question about professionalization is is really complex we're doing a piece of work on it at the moment about how it could be worked I think it's it's hugely complicated and needs to be part of a wider reform because it's not just about pay it's about as you say qualifications training and um, the status of the, of the work as well Mm. I was was looking through the questions. Maggie Langins has asked a very similar related question, uh, particularly around um, uh, whether there's an increased value for carers um, as a result of these reforms, Um, you know, not just the workforce, but but maybe informal carers. Is uh, is that any evidence of that? Support for carers? Support? No, that's one of the, I think neither country's really cracked either the formal or the informal workforce um, pressures in both countries despite having higher qualifications the status of the work is still fairly low and it certainly doesn't have parity with health in either country so they're they're still they're still facing interestingly some of the same issues that we have here so um uh the, there have been a few people mentioning and uh, deborah rosansky and um, Francis Dickinson and, and tangentially Janice Steed, uh, this issue about the integration between health and social mm. care and the need to get a funding system that is uh, supports that interface. Now, um, you know, if, if those two funding systems can be well aligned, there is a, a, an a priori case that, that the um, this will help to promote longer, healthier life expectancy, even amongst those who are uh, receiving personal care um, uh, for long periods of time. So w- what are your views about how well Germany and Japan have thought through that uh, integration issue? Yeah, so I think it's interesting that neither country went down the route of bringing the services together. So that's one of the proposals that's been put here. It's, you know, the NHS should take over social care. I think there are some real issues with that. I would worry about social care then becoming quite medicalized. Um, whereas I think it sits more, I mean, it, it's one of those services that needs to work alongside so many different services, but I think having it sat near housing, for example, um, and employment, I think, it, I think is more important in some ways. I think what the COVID situation has shown um, is that, Obviously, health and social care are very much interlinked. They're symbiotic systems, and that too much of the focus in the early days of the pandemic was on the NHS, with very little regard for the social care system. And social care is too often talked about as a support to the NHS. So, you know, some of the arguments made for yes. investing in social care is because yes. it will save the NHS, etc. I and think it's just, yes. you know, it has that value. misunderstands it. the dynamics quite fundamentally, exactly. doesn't it? Exactly. <laughs> but that's not to underplay the fact that the systems do have to work together. So Germany and Japan have two separate systems working alongside each other. The Japanese system seems to work more um, better in a sort of integrated way, but that's I think because the care system is so much wider, like the, just the scope of it. Um, overlap so much more with the health service Mm. and also in the Japanese system each individual who gets benefits is given there is assigned a care manager who can then put together help someone put together a care package and they can they can think about the health side of things as well so as well person sort of um, navigating both systems on the on the individual's behalf which I think helps Mm. Mm. and there's an alignment between the funding and the needs assessment in a way that uh, that that we don't seem to have yeah exactly um 
Francis uh, Dickinson has uh, just coming back to this cap again. Um, he's mm. he's saying the deal not cap wouldn't pull risk for those spending up to the cap, but uh, he says Natasha, you dismiss a potential insurance market for spend below the cap. He thinks pay perhaps a bit too easily. Um, he's suggesting that a colleague found there was some interest from private insurers for actually doing covering that part of the risk. That's interesting. I'd like to see the the um, evidence for the. For that interest because everything I've read from the um, the financial services industry is that they don't see it as a, as a, a feasible market and I think it's quite I think the cap has potential you know because that's a limited risk but to, to I think part of the issue is that the there'd be very little demand for it because a because people are are not very aware of the of social care. What is social care? Um, people don't want to think about social care in, in the future, their need for social care. Um, and so I think the financial services industry thought the, the demand for it would be quite low. And my understanding is that they've shown very little interest in moving into that market, but I've, I'm happy to be proved wrong. And I think the German example shows that there, there are some issues and complexities about doing so. So, um question from somebody different this time Anna Davis thanks for a great presentation Natasha she says um, given the conservative manifesto commitment which focuses on not selling your home for care um, how likely do you think that it is that the reform will go beyond a cap yeah I do get very frustrated when I see that the focus on when the problems in social care are boiled down to it's old people in their houses as I hopefully demonstrated, the problems in the system go way beyond that. And that if we focus just on that problem, that catastrophic cost and people not selling them, you know, being protected from selling their homes, then we're kind of missing an opportunity to fix the system. We're missing out huge swathes of the population who are missing out on, on care. Um, how optimistic am I? That I, I don't know. I mean, I think the quote I, left, I put in my last slide from Boris Johnson last week didn't fill me with great hope because I think he is hinting at a cap and the fact that he talked about care home funding specifically suggests that they're not potentially thinking about the whole system um, so I'm trying to be optimistic but I'm not I'm not sure I think the cap is the most likely um, proposal we might see coming up so I'm going to come on we've got time for one more question here Sarah Thompson uh, in the four funding options you talked us through, you didn't explicitly include an employment-based option. So do you think that might be an option that's on the, potentially on the cards? Does it reflect concerns about the instability of the labour market? Or? Yeah, no, that's an interesting one. So I didn't choose, and you, if you look at our full briefing, we do have many more options. So one of the options we look at is a kind of social insurance model where you, you pay into a national fund that's just based on income. Um, there's, I mean, there's some <clears throat> some advantages of that, you know, risk pooling, etc. But it is very much dependent on the performance of the economy, um, mm. and as I said before, uh, the, the the sort of wealth inequality in this country, and the fact that there's such a disparity between different generations, and the fact that property is so important here in a way that it's not in those other countries, I, I don't think just an income-based solution is the answer here. I think we need to look for a blended model that draws on income and wealth. Mm. Mm. Okay, well, look, it's now coming up to, to seven o'clock. Um, uh, we have, um, we're going to experiment with something here. Um, after we've closed, we thought we would stay open for those who'd like to carry on um, and have a chat. And we're going to actually um, make you make those of you who want to stay after seven o'clock participants so that you can uh, speak and share your video and, and have an informal chat with Natasha. Um, so any of you who would like to stay, um, please just hang on. I'm not going to turn them. I'm not going to turn the zoom off. Um, but I would like to take this opportunity just to thank Natasha for uh, an outstanding presentation and and your outstanding work in this area. It's a really complicated, difficult topic. And, um, uh, you know, it's also um, a real challenge to find a neat, ready made solution. So mm -hmm. Um, learning from other countries is, is really an essential part of the debate and the dialogue. And uh, we look forward to hearing of Boris's solution. Indeed, um, and, uh, <laughs> and having you back to comment on it, probably. Uh -huh. So.